Hey guys, how's it going? Just going to make a recording here, talk more about covenant theology and dispensationalism. And um, I wanted to try out some of these new features on this uh, Screencast-O-Matic program because they've added it in some editing options, which is really cool. I think that uh, I've always wanted to have intros and outros for the videos, and I've done it here and there. But hopefully, you know, I can do it more consistently, and I think I can do that with this program. And I've made some new short intros and outros, but uh, anyway... I do want to talk about some more things, and I was looking more into it today. And uh, I was reading through the Dispensationalism book by Charles Ryrie, looking at some of the eschatology of Dispensationalism, you know, stuff that's concerning the end times and basically the Millennial Kingdom. But also looking at Wikipedia, uh, Covenant Theology on Wikipedia, you know, they talk about how let me see here. Oh, that's cool. I can do that on this computer. I moved my video of myself recording onto another monitor so I can fully look at this Wikipedia article. If you look at the Wikipedia article on Covenant Theology, uh, at the end of the first, you know, the second paragraph, it says, Methodist hermeneutics traditionally use a variation of this known as Wesleyan Covenant Theology, which is consistent with Armeni Arminian soteriology. So there we see that... Um, Calvinism isn't, or, you know, covenant theology isn't exclusive to Calvinism. You know, Arminians use it as well. But we see the three theological covenants that's mentioned on covenant theology. They have the covenant of works, the covenant of grace, and the covenant of redemption. I've talked about this before. But if we look at the covenant of redemption, what does Wikipedia say about that? It says the covenant of redemption is the eternal agreement within the Godhead in which the Father appointed the Son to become the incarnate, to become incarnate, suffer and die as a federal head of mankind to make an atonement for their sin. In return, the Father promised to raise Christ from the dead, glorify him, and give him a people. Two of the earliest theologians to write about the covenant of redemption were Johannes Cosius, I don't know how to pronounce that, and John Owen, I don't know who they are, though Caspar Olivian had hinted at the idea before them. This covenant is not mentioned in the Westminster Standards, but the idea of a contractual relationship between the Father and the Son is present. Scriptural support for such a covenant may be found in Psalms 2 and 110, Isaiah 53, Philippians 2, 5 through 11, and Revelation 5, 9 through 10. Some covenant theologians have denied the intra-Trinitarian covenant of redemption, or have questioned the notion of the Son's works leading to the reward of gaining a people for God or have challenged the covenantal nature of this arrangement. Robert Lethem has criticized the idea of the covenant between the persons of the Trinity as departure from Trinitarian orthodoxy and tending towards tritheism, pointing to the historical fact of tritheistic heresy in Presbyterian circles during the generations immediately following the Westminster Assembly. So they say that the covenant of redemption is this agreement between the Father and the Son within the Godhead before creation, that basically Jesus would, um, you know, suffer and die for the sins of mankind, and that the Father would raise him from the dead, glorify him, give him a people. When I read The Christ of the Covenants by Old Palmer Robertson, I think was his name, um, or Palmer Old Robertson, whatever, he uh, said that the covenant of redemption started started at Genesis 3.15, basically after the fall when God um, uh, made a covenant to redeem mankind, basically. And um, so you see that when O. Palmer Robertson talks about the covenant of redemption, it's a, cove it's, a, it's a covenant between God and man. And then this general or this popular view of covenant theology, their covenant of redemption is, the covenant between the God, between the Father and the Son and the Godhead, which is kind of strange to me. And uh, I like I like the other one better. I like you know what the Christ of the Covenants teaches, but it doesn't seem to be m maybe the popular, overly accepted view of covenant theology. So it's very interesting. I'd like to see more people that that believe go by what he believes. I think that. Um, you know, the covenants all have to deal with God and man and um, the redemption of mankind. 
And what I'm saying, mankind, I'm going to throw this just in there for another extra thing, because I was thinking, and I, maybe I should make this as a separate video, but I was thinking of how Stephen Anderson said that women aren't made in the image of God. He doesn't believe. I was looking at Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It says, So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And so... You know, you might get this idea that it says when God created man in his own image and the image of God created he him. You're thinking that it's talking of Adam because Adam was male. But I think it's talking about mankind in general. When God created man, meaning mankind, meaning humans, meaning male and female. And that's why it explicitly states later on male and female created he them. Okay. And so, yes, females are made in the image of God, but I just thought that was interesting. Uh, you know, God created man in his own image, meaning mankind in the image of God. Created he him. Male and female created he them. <clears throat> so when it says created he him, yeah, I mean, I think it just means male, male, gen, male, or mankind in general, basically, and it's kind of uh, personifying mankind as a male. So it, gives, it says him, but it really means like mankind. Anyways, back to dispensationalism. I want to look. I highlighted some stuff in this. I just go over some of it randomly. Talking about the millennial kingdom, Charles O'Reilly says that the doctrine of the millennial kingdom is for the dispensationalists an integral part of his entire scheme and interpretation of many biblical passages. So he says the millennial kingdom is for the dispensationalists an integral part of his entire scheme. So you got to see how foundational the millennial kingdom is to dispensationalism. And you know when they say that, that God has a purpose for Israel and he has a purpose for the church, because they think that these per this, these promises for uh, the land are you know haven't been fulfilled, and they think that they're going to be fulfilled you know physically on the earth, and they think that it's going to be fulfilled in this millennial kingdom, and so that's really what it kind of comes down to. Let's see. There's some charges against dispensationalism here. You dispensational dispensationalists teach that when Christ came to earth, he offered Israel. The Davidic kingdom promised in the Old Testament, but you do not answer the question. How could that offer be one that was made legitimately and sincerely if Christ knew that he had gone to the cross, or that he had to go to the cross? If you still insist that it was a genuine offer, you have to admit the possibility that Israel could have accepted the offer, and if they had, then the cross would have been avoided unnecessary. And then someone else said, when we press the vital question, what in case the offer had been accepted would have become of the cross of Calvary and the atonement for the sins of the world? The best answer we get is that in the, in the event, atonement would have been made some other way. Think of it, some other way than by the cross. So these people against dispensationalism are saying that um, dispensationalism teaches that Christ tried to offer the Davidic kingdom, the earthly kingdom, to the Jews, and they rejected it. And they're saying, so what if the Jews would have accepted it, then there would have, wouldn't have been, you know, he wouldn't have went to the cross. And uh, he makes up some arguments to say that's kind of a foolish, you know, what if. And it kind of is, um, because, you know, you could say lots of stuff like that, you know, even without the, you know, Davidic kingdom being offered. What if, you know, just, what if everybody just got saved, you know, everybody chose to believe in Christ, then, then, you know, he wouldn't have went to the cross. Um, but he's basically saying that the cross is minim minimized with dispensationalism, and I do agree with that. Um, let's see. The Jews have been received this religious version. Yeah. So he says, you know, if the Jews had received this alleged spiritual kingdom and had been saved, does that not mean that the cross might have been unnecessary? Okay. No, it wouldn't be unnecessary, but, you know, the questions are kind of stupid. But I do think that 
you know, they put dispensationalists put a lot more emphasis on the millennial kingdom than they do the cross. Because, you know, if we if you believe in covenant theology then you realize that everything was fulfilled in Christ, you know, everything is completed. And um you know, we have all the all the promises in Christ and then we inherit the kingdom in Christ and everything. And uh but yeah, they're looking for something beyond that. Uh, let's see. It was the Davidic kingdom that Jesus offered and not the general rule of God over the earth of or his spiritual reign over an individual lives. If the spiritual kingdom was Christ was offering, then such an announcement would have no special significance whatsoever to Israel, for such a rule of God was always recognized among the people of God. So he's saying... Israel were expecting this Davidic kingdom. And if Jesus was offering some kind of a spiritual kingdom, then it wouldn't have any significance. Well, in the Christ of the Covenants, he talks about how dispensationalists say that Christ offered the kingdom. But he says that, you know, what the Bible really teaches was that Christ, you know, proclaimed that he was the king, and they rejected Jesus as the king. And so there's a difference there. And um, that was significant. It was significant that, you know, Jesus was the Messiah also. He was the Christ, and he proclaimed to be so. And um, and they didn't accept that. The dispensationalist recognizes all the various ways in which God ruled, but keeps distinct the church as another purpose of God in addition to his kingdom purposes. Which is crazy. Because, you know, the purpose is the same for the church and his kingdom. The contrast is not between materialistic and spiritual, which is what the Christ of the Covenant said, but between the presence and absence of the king on this earth. No, it is between the materialistic and the spiritual. You know, I don't know. I'm going to look more through this book. I want to go on some other studies. Hopefully the next day or two I'll sit down and choose a different study to go over. Maybe do like a whiteboard video or something. The Deity of Christ or something that I need to finish up. But I'm still going to be hovering around this dispensational covenant theology thing for quite a while as I construct, you know, better uh, teachings on that. But anyway, I'll see you guys again soon. God bless.